Thank you, Professor Nishikanda and uh, Professor Ramendra Singh for inviting me to speak to you today and it's my, it's my great pleasure to come out to IAM Calcutta where I did teach a course uh, as we found out it was eight years ago I taught a course on sustainable business in uh, the PGP X program. So it's a great opportunity to, to come back. Um, <clears throat> as you heard in the, the introduction, the talk today will actually focus on what businesses can do and what leaders can do, business leaders can do in these turbulent times because in the last two years, the world has faced an unprecedented kind of crisis, both in terms of uh, not only COVID-19, but also global warming, increasing inequality, the great resignation. There are you know, many, many reasons to believe that business cannot continue the way it has for you know, the last century or so post the Industrial Revolution. So there is a big need today for business to change the way it operates. And I'm going to talk about one such, one such change you know, I'm not saying this is the answer to every problem that we are facing, but I think that we, I will tell you one way that businesses can move forward and not only help the planet, but also themselves. So business itself has to be sustainable, so the you know, and, and that is secondary to the planet, of course, be sustainable, but how can businesses sustain themselves? And I, my argument is, they cannot sustain themselves if they continue along, along the old, old path of profit maximization, which I'm sure you have heard and, and kind of embraced by now and probably as 
the way the business should, should operate. So let us start by looking at some of the challenges Ampersand 
in between, so that, uh, which articles cover both of these, you get about 65 million hits. You know? And why is that? It is because both of these events have their roots in this idea that we can keep on taking, taking, taking from the earth, and it's all good, you know, nothing is going to happen. But the earth is a place of finite resources. We forget that. We forget that clean air is finite. At a, in a, at a particular point in time, it's not even finite, you know. And water is finite. Rare earth minerals are finite. So there are plenty of finite resources. But we act as if they're infinite. And so if you do that, and, and why is that in the case of the coronavirus? Because the coronavirus, if you read the kind of background of it, right, is traced back to kind of man's interaction with these exotic animals, you know, and, and this wet market in China, which was selling these pangolins, which I was shocked, absolutely shocked to read that it's a $76 billion market eating exotic animals, the $76 billion market, right? And if, if, if man wants to encroach on nature, and if man wants to kind of assert itself aggressively on nature, this is nature's way of fighting back. Right now, the coronavirus is having a bigger laugh than mankind is, correct? They are winning. They, 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 they've done incredible. I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the progress of, you know, or, or what the virus has done through the eyes of the virus, it's a stunning success. Right? So we have to kind of cut, cut back and realize that we are here on a planet where it's not possible to do whatever it is we want to do. And the second point is that this is all. This, both of these are an example of how capitalism, which is the business model we've embraced, you know, for good reason, capitalism has a lot of benefits and it has done a lot of good things for us. But when you commodify life to turn it into profit, these are the kinds of things that can happen. And if the coronavirus is, if you think that the coronavirus is a bad thing or is a scary thing, you know, you have no idea then what climate change can, can actually do and the impact, the, the menacing impact that climate change can have. So this is a quote by Noam Chomsky, who's one of the great thinkers of our time, and he says, there is a much greater horror approaching. We are racing to the edge of disaster, far worse than anything that's happened in human history. Talking about climate change. Because climate change can really cause floods, it can cause droughts, it can cause migration of a scale that we cannot even imagine when certain countries are going to be flooded, what are people going to do? They're going to try to get to other countries which are, which are better off. Right. So that is the so so you, we should be treating the coronavirus as a warning sign to kind of mend our ways and to adjust our business model think in a different way. Realize that it's not just about money. And if you haven't realized that by now, please talk to me later. So this slide is the heart of my talk. And this slide is called From the Tragedy of the Commons to the Triple Bottom Line. So the tragedy of the commons is this concept, phenomenon that was described by uh, uh, a social, social scientist in the early 60s, where the observation was that if each, one of, if each one of us tries to maximize our private gain, then that leads to a collective loss. We all do, right? So if each one of us tries to maximize our private gain, so if I want to get as many fish out of the sea as possible, and each of us wants to get as many fish out of the sea as possible, then the sea runs out of fish. Okay, and somebody was mentioning a simulation. This is actually a simulation in the high in my class for fish tanks. And it happens every time. Even in a course in sustainability, 
where everybody knows that the professor must be having something in, up in his mind why is he giving us this simulation. But the profit motive takes over and everybody is like buying ships and sending them to the sea and catching fish and finding them on fish. What's that? That's a, that's a collective loss. Now, if every company wants to build a factory and not pay for the pollution, not pay for the healthcare of the workers, right? it, it's the same thing. So then we have global warming and then we have your um, healthcare prices and all these kinds of things. So anytime individuals try to maximize private gain, it leads to a collective loss. And this was observed by this social scientist Hardin in, in the 60s. And you will see that in this two by two that I have, so the idea is that, okay, you're creating social and environmental value on one axis, and you're driving business value on the other axis. So the tragedy of the commons is the phenomenon where businesses took away, took away value from society and from the environment by pollution, by treating workers poorly, etc., etc., human rights abuses. So that's this space. But they made enormous profit. Post-industrial revolution, the wealth of the world has gone up by, by orders of magnitude. Right? Mostly concentrated at the top, but still it has gone up by orders of magnitude. So that's how they played this game. And this is where we are. There we are at the kind of all these crises, etc., that I showed you. So therefore, the first transition has to be from the upper left to the upper right. And what is the upper right say? That hey, we are creating value, social environmental value, and by creating that value, we are also boosting business value at the same time. Now, is that possible? Is that actually possible that we, if we treat our environment better, if we treat our people better, then kind of our business also improves, our business operations also improve. Which is possible. So there are certain conditions and research has shown, and this is the paper I published on this topic 20 years ago today, you know, that there are certain conditions under which business can actually boost its profitability by creating environmental initiatives and social initiatives. Because if you're environmentally responsible, you need to spend less on energy. You need to spend less on water. You need to spend less on waste removal. Save money, right? Which goes to the bottom line. At the same time, your employees are happier. They find more meaning in their job, so they work harder for you. Your customers reward you for your sustainability initiatives. So all these go to boost your business value. Now tell me, if I can show you that there is a relationship between doing good and doing well, as depicted in this upper right hand quadrant, shouldn't everybody want to do that? Shouldn't every company say, yeah, well, this is the way to make money, and I'm going to go down this path. And that's what I thought. I've I'm the next Einstein. I've, I've, I've shown this relationship. So I will have lots and lots of people coming, running to me, and you know, my pop, my bank balance will keep rising very, very quickly. Didn't happen. It's like, okay, what's going on? Why is that not happening? So since the consulting didn't work out, I said, okay, at least let me try to write a book around me. So I published this book in 2011 which was really about how do we leverage corporate responsibility. So at that time, sustainability language was still not that common, corporate responsibility. And what I tried to find in this, uh, described in this book is kind of how can, how do stakeholders react when companies do good things? Stakeholders can be investors, they can be suppliers, they can be consumers, they can be employees, they can be any one of those community members. So how do they react to the companies? So it was a more of a consumer behavior kind of flavor in this book. And I was just telling you that at the time I got a very big grant from Procter and Gamble, so that was one of the companies I studied. I studied General Mills, I studied several companies. 
And I visited them, talking to the people how this mission is happening, etc. And when I was doing that, I made one fundamental observation. And that was that these guys, these CSR managers or sustainability managers, they were very good people, but they were very lonely. They did not have a seat at the high table of the company, at the strategic high table of the company. They did not have a relationship with the CEO. They did not have a relationship with the C-suite, which struck me as, you know, weird because everything that I was saying was that for to leverage corporate responsibility, you have to integrate it with the strategy of the firm. It cannot be disconnected. You cannot just do some ad hoc program here, an ad hoc program there, and expect to make money from it. No. You can make money from it only if it is completely baked into your strategy and embedded into the DNA of your company. So I said, okay, so here is my next project. I want to see how we can actually kind of, you know, integrate the Swiss C-Street and the CEO into kind of these issues of corporate responsibility and sustainability. I started talking to these managers who I was teaching. I was living in Germany at the time. I was doing quite a bit of executive education. There was only one roadblock in my theory, in my theory right? And the roadblock was that sustainability, so now the lingo has kind of shifted to sustainability, still the well-being of our planet and people, nothing more than that, is viewed as someone else's problem. So I come to you and say, hey, what about sustainability? Yeah, 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 it's important, but we have someone to take care of that in our company. You know, we have a sustainability department, you know, it's their job. I, I'm a finance guy, I mean, come on, uh, let's not compare apples and oranges. Next person, same thing, same thing. And therefore, the sustainability manager is isolated. And if the system manager is isolated, you cannot make progress. You just cannot make progress at the scale you need to make progress to kind of, you know, uh, win this battle. But not all companies are, good, are like that. And that was the silver lining to my cloud. There are a handful of companies where sustainability is everyone's problem. And one such company is Unity. So PG Tips is a, is a tea made by Unilever in the UK, it's very popular. And one of the floor, shop floor workers at Unilever came up with this idea whereby we could reduce three millimeters of the package. You know there's a paper package that, that, from the seal of the thing. Three, three millimeters. You might think that three millimeters is like really nothing. But if you multiply three millimeters by the scale of the company and how many tea bags they produce, it's all the details are given in my book, but it amounts to thousands of tons of paper and you know thousands of dollars in, 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 in savings over the course of the year. So and this came from the shop floor, this example. Right. So that sparked in me, so okay, I have to understand. Why some, in some companies people come up with these ideas and they get implemented and, you know, the company. So Unilever is one of the shining lights. You can look up any uh, report, magazine, whatever you want. They're one of the leading lights in sustainability. How is it? They've already achieved gender equality in their management. 50% gender balance in their management. Uh, one of the first companies to be able to do that. How is that? So what I did was I interviewed 25 plus global big companies because my theory was that look, if you cannot change the big companies, if you cannot understand what's preventing them from implementing sustainability um, kind of and, and mass, then nothing else is going to happen. We can wait for the smaller ones, mom and pops, because the model I'm going to present is applicable to everybody. But in, in, in full disclosure, I only studied the big companies. More than 100 interviews, and this is the this is the heart of the thing. Chief marketing officer of Unilever, who's also heading sustainability, basically says, make sustainability everyone's job. If you have one exception in the company, everyone thinks they're that exception, right? Then everyone thinks they're the exception, then it becomes just the sustainability department's job. So instead of 
than that, let's follow this route where it's everybody's job in the, in the country. Right? And that's, that's where we are trying to go with the rest of this talk. How do we do that? How do we embed sustainability into the DNA so that every employee, and remember, Unilever has 160,000 employees, right? IBM has more than that. Accenture has it even more than that. If all, if everybody participates in making their company and therefore the planet more sustainable, then we can achieve change at a much faster, at a much faster rate. That's the basic idea, right? So the thing that I thought of when I was visiting this Unilever factory in a place called Kanga in, in Maharashtra, which is eight hours away from Mumbai, to take an overnight train to get there, and middle of nowhere, basically. And there I learned that this factory folks had actually come up with an idea to harvest rainwater because it was a water stressed area to harvest rainwater for production so that their production could continue and they don't run out and so on. And as I spent that day there, this word ownership, it's so, so what is happening in plain English, they're taking ownership of the problem and acting on it. So ownership, let me look at the literature. And sure enough, there is a very nice literature on psychological ownership, which says that people don't necessarily have to own objects. They can also own ideas. It doesn't have to be legal ownership in nature. It can be this psychological ownership. So you can take ownership of a concept like sustainability, okay, taking care of the planet is my job as well, not just yours or yours, but all of our job, right? So ownership is part of the human condition. John Paul Sartre, the famous philosopher, said something to this effect that ownership is part of the human condition. And as all of us know, ownership is actually also part of the extent itself. So we own things that lend us a sense of identity, that create a sense of identity. So I, I own a car, but it does not give me any real sense of fulfillment that I own a car. But I have a record collection, which I really have a sense of ownership over, because that's part of my identity, that I'm a music lover. See what I'm saying? Right. So you have to endow that. So how do we endow this sense of ownership? to every employee in the organization. Maybe all of them won't bite, but at least I can try, right? And at least half of them might bite tomorrow, 60%, etc., etc. And the whole journey really starts with understanding what does ownership, what does ownership do for us, psychologically, as human beings? It helps us fulfill three fundamental needs. One is the need for efficiency. That's like each of us wants to be problem solvers in the world. We want to feel confident that we can do something, whatever it is. If I can, believe it or not, I actually struggled to try to put on this mask in, uh, <laughs> and how to adjust the strap. But when I could do it by myself, I thought, okay, thank God, and I'm actually you know, at least with this much of an advantage. We like to feel confident, right? So sustainability offers the chance to everybody to feel confident. Without the light, you feel better about yourself. You know, you print too sided or don't print. Okay, I'm not going to print. I'm going to read this digitally. Feel better about yourself. So everybody from the mail room to the board room of a company can do something about it. Self identity is the opportunity to express your personal values and identities at work. And we talked about the lack of meaning in the workspace today. People don't want. What does profit mean to the factory worker? What does profit mean? To the, what does money mean to the factory worker? And so you work faster and faster so that we can make more and more money. That guy is not getting any, any bonus and you know, not getting millions of dollars in stock options or whatever. So that person is much more motivated by the, kind of the social benefit that their work is producing. Right? So <clears throat> again, at Unity, I met one employee who said, I find it much more meaningful to think that I'm saving lives by my work. So it's making life a you know, The life was an anti-bacterial soap, you all know, but it fights child mortality because these children don't wash hands regularly, etc., etc. So I would 
watch you all to die thinking that I'd be saving lives rather than selling souls. Now, who wouldn't? Saving lives is a good thing. Right? So, for the shopkeeper worker, this profit maximization thing just doesn't work. But if you actually can give them this opportunity to express their values, it's a very, very powerful, powerful release, you know, empowerment. And final thing is belonging. And belonging basically means that, okay, I'm part of a larger collective. I'm part of a solution. So, okay, I'm doing something for my children by fighting, by, by being more sustainable. So sustainability is a prime candidate, essentially, for fulfilling these three fundamental human needs that ownership helps us fulfill. And that's why it's a sustainability is good candidate. So using all of these, I developed this model, a conceptual framework, rather, which has three phases. And I'll just describe them to you in, 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 in brief. So there's an incubation phase, very, very important to make that okay. What is our sustainability plan going to be like? What are we going to do? Because we can't solve, everybody cannot solve the world's entire problems. What is the niche we are going to work in? The second thing is to take that little niche that you define and cascade that through your organization so that all your employees know what they should be kind of looking out for. Everybody doesn't have to run after CO2. A consulting company might have, you know, healthcare is a much more important kind of concern than uh, reducing the environmental footprint. And then we have to train them, so entice and enable. And then final phase in the model is called entrench, which means that I want to routinize sustainable behaviors. I want to routinize. So for some of you, I hope putting off the tap when you brush your teeth is a routine behavior, for example. I'm not going to let the tap run while I brush my Similarly, I want to make it a case that any business decision I make, I want to think about the environment and I want to think about society. What are the implications of this decision socially and environmentally? And then I make that decision. And that, that itself is doing business through the sustainability lens, which was the theme for today. So let's take a look at quickly some of these uh, Factors, so I said incubate, and here is the most important factor, which is defining the, your purpose. Defining your purpose. Now, your purpose is not the same as your mission or your vision. Mission is what do we do? Vision is where do we want to go? Purpose is why do we do what we do? Why do we do what you do? Are we selling food or are we trying to provide nourishment? You know, the, dis the distinction is non-trivial because if you frame it in terms of nourishment rather than selling food, it offers that sense of fulfillment to the person who's actually making that food. And if it's just about selling food mindlessly, then that attachment, that emotional attachment to the, to the job is, 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 is simply not there. So, great story from an electric utility company called Enel, very large company based out of Italy. And what happened there was the CEO was standing in the middle of this desert uh, in the Middle East. And his job was to supervise, oversee this building of this power plant. And he said, look, I could see that these trucks coming down the hill with fuel to power the plant. And there were these power lines going to, out from the plant, but with no local feed yet. So there was nothing. It was not going over the house or yet. He said, what, why are we building this power line in the middle of the desert? So digging, doing some digging, I realized it was a piece of, dubious piece of social engineering. The idea was that they would be building air-conditioned tents in the middle of the desert so that the nomads and the veterans could come and sit in those air-conditioned tents and watch TV. He said, none of this makes sense because these guys are not interested in, <laughs> in this thing. And he said, that's when I realized that the purpose of an electricity company is not to foist new habits on people, but is rather to enable people to do what they want to do. Keep warm, keep cool, or my laptop, and that led to that sense of purpose. So he said, why do we do what we do? We are not in the business of selling cars but rather we are in the business of providing mobility, right? 
So if you define it that way, a car company can also be building trains, it can be building uh, buses, it can actually the job is mobility. It can get into car sharing, no restrictions, right? So that's the ideal purpose. And each of us can have a purpose as well. So I can inspire you, I, I ask you to kind of think about this later, what is, what is my purpose? my personal purpose. So once you've done that, you've got to define kind of what's material for you. What is material? Material means what's really important. What areas of sustainability are you going to focus on? Like I said, everybody doesn't have to focus on CO2. Everybody doesn't have to focus on water, etc. So there is a technique called materiality analysis, which we can do to define or to identify the priorities that the company has. What would be two or three things that we must do as a company? Could be water, CO2, but it could also be kind of you know human rights. It could be cyber security. It could be, it could be financial inclusion. So these are all kind of different kinds of things. That, but you've got to do that materially because if you want to focus on everything, in some sense you focus on nothing, and then nothing gets done. But if you have, if you have three clear goals. You can cascade those down to your employee base. They can get a deep understanding of, okay, these are the things that we need to tackle, and you go from there. So materiality. Once you have this, your purpose and your materiality figured out, you're ready then to empower your stakeholders to act sustainably. The first thing is to kind of entice them, to lure them, to say, hey, you've got to integrate sustainability into your job. And that's not an easy thing. Because they'll say, man, I mean, I have to do so much already, and now you want me to like, take on one more thing. Well, 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 it's not just one more thing. I mean, it's something that's really you know, good uh, for the business, and it's good for um, um, your, your, your future, your children's future. So we use appeals both to the head, which is like, hey, if you cut down on the packaging, it can save you money. That's the, that's the smart thing to do. And the heart is like, hey, if 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 you know the world heats up to an extent where there'll be floods, what are our children going to do? I'm personally worried. I have an 18-year-old son. I'm personally worried what's going to happen to him 50 years down the road. I won't be there. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to, you know, care about what happens to the world, right? So Apple, they told me the story, in fact, that they had a lot of fun going into businesses and talking to line managers saying, hey, if you can reduce the amount of kind of, you know, cobalt or whatever that is in our phones, you can save money from that, and it's, it's um, good for the planet. But it's not enough to create willingness, so entice is creating willingness. We have to create ability as well. Because everything is not as simple as putting up lights and, and printing two sided and all that. There are very serious kind of uh, scientific things like eco-efficiency analysis and all of that. So management has to invest in training. Training in management systems so that it's easier to integrate sustainability into your job. That's of key interest, right? If, if something is difficult, I'm less likely to do it than if something is easy. Right? So you want to lower the cost of acting sustainably by investing in training and management systems and you want to increase the benefit of acting sustainably by promoting people who actually do the job well, right? Psychic rewards, financial incentives, you can tie your bonus, bonuses, yearly bonuses to sustainability performance. All of these things increase the benefits. And when the benefits outweigh the cost, well, hey, it's, it's not so difficult to push this button and figure out uh, which raw materials are, you know, sustainably procured, which are not, etc. When it's at the push of a button, you're likely to do it. And if you get recognition for it, then you're more likely to do it. So we've got to alter that cost-benefit balance. And that's how you can make it everyone's job. You want to penetrate departments. And so in my book, there are specific sections on how you integrate it into marketing, into HR, into the investment function, into the supply chain. No exception. Everyone's job in the organization. And the final step is this uh, entrenched or routinized 
And there, I call for three steps. One is kind of, you've got to communicate progress. We, ownership loves to see kind of, there is been some progress, and that helps us take more ownership of the problem. If I, if you tell your employees, hey guys, great job, you helped us save 100, you know, whatever grams of CO2 last month. Wow, you know, we've done something. Right? So keep giving them progress reports of the difference that they're making, and that kind of cheers them up, that, that boosts them, kind of, you know, to do more. Co-creation, so co-create solutions with them. What does co-creation mean? It's like, okay, we have an idea contest. Please tell us what are the things we can do to make our company more sustainable. And you will find everybody wants to give you ideas on what to do. That's a co-creation. People love to contribute ideas. So, got to tap into that. And finally, you've got to celebrate your successes. So, it's like it's a difficult area. So we have marketing awards and advertising awards, right? Don't we have those coming out every year? What about sustainability award? So a company like Marks and Spencer's, a very big retailer that we are aware of because it's in India as well, they have like Oscar, Oscar style red carpet parties where they pull out store, in, just the regular store employees and give them awards in front of hundreds of thousands of people YouTube channel, this, that, whatever. So just to showcase that this is something good. And there are companies that celebrate failures as well, saying that if you don't fail, that means you're not trying hard enough with your ideas and so on. And the final part about <coughs> entrenching is expanding this idea of sustainability ownership to not just my company, everybody in my company, but to everybody in my industry and saying it's not my planet, but it's our planet. It's our problem. It's our industry, right? So building these collaborative platforms with traditional competitors, which is unheard of in the traditional business world. We want to kind of keep everything very guarded in terms of secrets and stuff, right? But here we are saying, let's not compete on saving the planet. I mean, you know, we can compete with our products in the marketplace, but let's put sustainability in the big competitive space. And one great example of that is this certified sustainable palm oil. You know, palm oil is a big problem area for deforestation, so there is this uh, traditional competitors like Nestle, uh, Colgate, uh, Unilever, all together trying to solve the problem. So let me give you some examples of what this ownership kind of looks like, right? And so the first quote is from a very, very large company, retail company, and it's the chief sustainability officer who's telling me this. It says that some of the great leaps and breakthroughs with sustainability have happened because people across the organization have been inspired to change things themselves without coming to me for permission. They know their part of the business better than me. And how true that is. I mean, you're a large company. Chief Sustainability Officer doesn't know what's happening here and what the problems are. So people have to have that autonomy. They have to have that sense of empowerment so that they actually kind of implement those changes. So that's one story. Another one is the, is the factory director who tells me, an employee who decides that he can make changes to a valve that will save energy or save water. One individual employee is talking about. An employee who decides to do something differently with the way the water flows through a line or our electricity use. And the last sentence is the most important. To add all of those up, the executive said, you get a very big difference. So if you have, rather than one pair of eyes, if you have a hundred pair of eyes looking around, trying to move your company on towards sustainability, it's likely to happen much more. So that's the spirit, that's the essence of small actions, big difference, right? which was the title of the book. Right? Now, from here, there is an empirical follow-up. And this is a paper in the third round of the Journal of Business Ethics. I'm not going to get into details. But it's like you can say, well, I mean, you've written a book, 
law and anecdotal, etc. I mean, how do we know that any of this works in practice? Hence the effect of follow up, right? So, and, and what we've done is we've done uh, field studies, two field studies, um, an, an experiment, and, and a survey. So, all together to show to show that you know purpose when you have when employees perceive that their company has a higher purpose beyond profit maximization, they take more ownership of sustainability for sure, and that drives their sustainable behavior. So this is what if, this is by empirical I mean quanti quantified and the relationships purely about that, right? And then we find on the on, so we replicate that in an experiment. Then we introduce a moderator, which is your this sense of autonomy, which I talked about in the quote that I gave you, that you have that sense of empowerment that the company allows me to do what I want to do. Doesn't happen in McDonald's. A company like McDonald's, if you have to make a hamburger, it's fully scripted, like you've got to keep this for 20 seconds, you've got to you know, do this for 10 seconds, whatever. But here, you've got to take matters into your own hands, use your own creativity to solve the problem. And that's what you meant. So we found that indeed, you know, when they feel this sense of autonomy, this relationship is, is, is stronger and they exhibit more sustainable behaviors. And finally, one more factor was this idea of moral identity centrality or how important is sustainability to or morals to me personally. So if I think that moral, if, I, if I'm the kind of person for whom morals are more important than less, then I'm more likely to engage in, in, sustain, in sustainability, uh, in sustainability behaviors. So this uh, this paper exists. If anybody is interested, I'm happy to uh, happy to share it. Hopefully, it will be published soon. But all this to say that there is now evidence, empirical evidence, beyond that anecdotal evidence that I showed you, uh, like my book evidence to show that actually purpose can drive ultimately sustainable behaviors, which is a very encouraging sign. All right, so I leave you with this thought. If we don't inherit the earth from our parents, we borrow it from our children. Now, you guys are young, but you will at one point also have to, you know, you will have children and we have to think about the future generations. So this is about the future. It's, it's, it's really not about us because in my generation, what we can do is we can set the stage for the real change, for the acceleration to come. And if you keep this in mind, this is not just about us, but it's as well about the future, right? And it's about the future generations who will come onto this planet. And we want the planet to exist in a healthy way when they come onto it, maybe that will inspire you to get to do more uh, in this regard. And what can we what can we do? We can certainly play our individual parts of, of kind of putting up lights and this and that. But we can also talk to other people saying, look, have you calculated your carbon footprint ever? You know, the footprint calculators that are available, you know, and, and the exact answer is not the most important thing, but directionally kind of where are you where can you make changes that will be beneficial to cutting down your footprint? Those are the kinds of things one can learn. Anyway, I won't state my welcome. Uh, Arun Zaki Roy wrote a fascinating um, editorial uh, in April 2020, which is really when the pandemic was kind of raging, right? And what she says is that historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world on the moon. This one is no different. It's a portal. We are now in a portal. Some kind of gateway between our old world and the new world. Right. And I'll skip the middle of it. You know, so we can say, well, we can carry all our baggage with us, etc., our data banks, our dead ideas, our libraries, etc. Or we can walk through lightly, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And I hope the younger generation here will in fact think about walking lightly into this next world without the baggage of the past 
and they're ready to fight for a new world. They're ready to fight for a new business, a new way of doing business, which is fun. But it's also a win-win-win. It's a win for the planet, it's a win for our people, and it's a win for business. It's a win for profit as well. Okay. So, I have a center in, in Pittsburgh and we discuss these things um, on a regular basis. You're welcome to look at it on the website if you're interested. But I thank you for your attention and I shall now stop. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. The floor is open for questions if anybody has any live questions. questions. Uh, I have a question. Okay. So, Sustainability officer, you can say, hey, can I get engaged with something? You know, 
I want to be part of this movement in, in the country. And you will find that then you will get a very warm reception, and then after that it will be up to your initiative. And if you can show by small actions, if you can show that there is a possibility to make change, you will be recognized as the top. So that's also a, a very good question. Essentially, if, if they are not being heard, then or are being ignored, then activism is one way out. So Amazon is a great example. So Amazon worked when Amazon was not hearing their workers, and, and so the workers kind of you know said, okay, we are not going to leave. They, they protested, they walked in the walkouts, and finally the company actually listened. Or pay raise and they have better benefits and, and, and all of that. So activism is definitely one way. The, the, and part of activism is collective action. So it cannot be one individual formal cannot make that a thing. But you saw what happened here in Delhi in with regard to the farmers and their you know dharna of kind of you know the prime minister and so on and, and finally the tables turned. Nobody believed that. One year ago, nobody actually believed that the farmers would be heard, but they were heard. So that's collective action, right? So that's collective action. And again, here, the sustainability officers would be those workers' best, best friends, because they do not want, you know, they are not the same as necessarily as the kind of the CEOs and, and all of that. They are the people who go to the brands. They do go to Philippines. They do go to Indonesia. They do go to the Silk. Okay, where, where, you know, kind of what is actually going on at the ground level? So they are an ally that, that you know the ground folks can use. And what you can do, or any company who is who is uh, has, has has the head in the right place, I would say, what they should do is they should communicate to the farm. In the language of that purpose that I talked about. So, what is the societal benefit that the company is trying to produce? Because the, to the farmer, money making for the company is not because they are still surviving hand to mouth. But the one thing that might make a difference to them and endear them to the company would be that look, I mean, with what you're growing, we are actually nourishing people. We are feeding. You know, or the training that you're doing is, you know, that that's helping X, Y, Z cause. So if you bring up the societal benefit, see, most of us do not talk about the societal benefit of, 
you know, the chair and the table, this is just there. You know, so Thank you. 